<laughs> Sorry about the projector struggling. Um, I built a badge for DEF CON this year. All of, these, all of those words will be explained. Probably not the word built. Most of the rest of the words will be explained, though. Um, trying to see what's the right background that I, should, that I should give about myself. OK, so I'm Kerry. I'm a firmware engineer. Sometimes I do some electrical stuff. Sometimes I try to use a mill. Mostly I keep it to electrical stuff. Um, I've been going to this cool thing called DEF CON for a while. It's a convention. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, this last year, I built a widget, a widget which you would refer to as a badge. Here is one of them. Um, I sold all of them, and I paid for my trip to the conference, which was cool, because I had never sold anything to anyone or built more than two of something ever. So there was a lot of learning that went on in that process. Uh, so this is sort of sharing that learning in a loose way. Sorry, I'm going to undo all the work we just did, unmirroring this, because it's freaking me out not seeing my own slides. Is going to involve hopefully not changing the projector resolution again. Okay, that was good. Now, where'd my Chrome window go? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Cool. So the three-second description of what they do, um, surprisingly irrelevant for this, for this presentation, um, is they're shaped like a dragonfly. They do RGB fading. Bright, colorful LEDs is a very important feature of all electronics. Uh, when, they're around, when they're not near each other, they just do random fading. When they are near each other, they synchronize a clock, and they use the clock to synchronize color fading, and then they all fade through the color space together. So when you stand in a circle talking to people, after five-ish minutes, they'll all be doing the same thing. And when you walk away, they all fade off into their own random patterns. So I guess the other part of the thing I, well, yeah, the things I said three seconds ago and I couldn't see my slides and I didn't know I wasn't supposed to say them yet. Uh, first time building more than two of something. Uh, it didn't cost me a huge amount of money. It made a little bit. That was all nice. Um, okay, so three second description of DEF CON. Uh, DEF CON is a hacker convention. DEF CON is the world's largest hacker convention. It requires a good definition of the word hacker. That's hard. If you're in this room, you probably know what a hacker is and may consider yourself to be one. Um, there are lots of different things at DEF CON. There are talks, which is a thing that DEF CON is known for. Um, there are other things. There's like, you can learn how to lockpick, and you can do capture the flag, and you can try to avoid tamper evidence seals, and lots of other stuff. Um, and another element of DEF CON is the badge to get into the conference, which is, this is a little less common now, but I think when it was new, it was maybe a little more common. They're sometimes elaborate. Sometimes they're just dumb pieces of fiberglass or plastic or rubber, and sometimes they're electronic, usually on a TikTok sort of cadence. Uh, that sort of became a funny cultural thing for DEF CON. So now, like, badges at DEF CON, where I think we're going to define a badge as anything you can wear around your neck on a lanyard. Whit <laughs> Whitney has a great example of something which is not a circuit board, which you can hang around your neck on a lanyard, so it's a badge. Um, so there's all sorts of badges. Badges are kind of hard to pin down. So here's a bunch from a, a meetup that a few of us had at DEF CON last year. There's a lot of things. This is, the, this is a vest. It has a lanyard. That's the thing that has a lanyard, so it's a badge. Um, we got a fidget spinner. Uh, we got a Tribble. We have a Linux computer. We've got Benchoff's Mr. Robot Head. Um, there's a lot of stuff. So I guess this is sort of to set the bounds for what a badge actually is, and then I'll describe what I did. So some random examples. Badges are complicated. This is made by a guy who goes by Red. It's a full multi-core wireless development system with this cool, he used these, the cool little bicolor OLED displays, but he wrote a driver to do like split screen stuff. So you can use the whole thing as one display. It's got a patch panel. It's got a full keyboard. It's got one of the RFM 69, whatever, Hope RF radios, uh, as well as an ESP something or other. Is it a 32? It has a, uh, is it an 8266 on reds? Okay, cool. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff. Uh, on the left, on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, uh, this is a picture of me, so of course I'm shilling for myself, so this is my own dragonfly. Um, the Tribble, which was this beautiful woven spheroid with this very lush hand-dyed fur and cool uh, LED eyes. Uh, and we have a Tiki badge. Uh, there's someone here who's wearing the Tiki badge. Uh, Wood filament for the body, so it smells wonderful. Um, really beautiful design, incredibly cool snap fit for the 3D print over the board so there were no fasteners, um, all sorts of things. Uh, other examples, always popular, top rules of DEF CON, deodorant badge, because it turns out if you go to a hacker convention, maybe you 
might need some help with the deodorant. Um, all important things for DEF CON, no rest. Take a sh one shower every day, two meals, three hours of sleep. Um, yeah. Uh, keys, so there are, Spectrum is electronic, Spectrum is also like mechanical and hand painted and, and beautiful. Um, this you can wear on a lanyard, it's a tiny, tiny black powder canyon, these are, these are beautiful. It turns out also the population of people who goes to a hacker convention is the population of people who like really cool guns and getting together to shoot their guns. So this is uh, an unofficial badge for the DEF CON shoot meetup, which happens every year. Um, and then two other examples of sort of setting a different, a different bound. Um, so the complexity range is wide. These I would put sort of on the top end. Crypto privacy isn't here because you're here, so I figure it's gonna come up. Um, so there are badges which are small and simple and built a few at a time by small groups of people or one person. There are badges built by teams of four or five over the course of the entire year for many tens of thousands of dollars that have multiplayer games and viral botnets um, and <laughs> self-reorganizing mesh networks and beautiful graphics and sound and all sorts of things. So, okay, those are all great. I should build a badge. I've been going to DEF CON for a little while. I should build a badge. I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, often people are part of a group and they build a badge to help fund the group's activities or they, they use it as like the entry key to a party or something like that. Um, so I was kind of thinking, I was trying to figure out what to make mine because I'm just a guy and I'm not really part of any groups, at least I guess besides Badge Life, ironically. Uh, there's a guy named Neil Stevenson who uh, writes books I really like. One of his books is called The Diamond Age. In it, there's a scene where the main character goes to a party and at that party she's given a dragonfly shaped cloisonne pin and over the course of the party she notices that it's like flashing colorful patterns synchronized with the other party goers and then in the context of the book there's nanites and it synchronizes the music and there's a lot of things that sh you can't find in AliExpress like nanites that synchronize with other people's brains. Um, so I figured I'd try to replicate that object. Um, okay, so you know, come up with a plan. So it needs to have so many LEDs because everything needs so many LEDs. It should have wireless communication, you know, like Bluetooth map. Maybe Laura, love that Laura, really keep trying to do things with Laura. Um, the Hope RF stuff is super common, so maybe we'll do like two or three of those. Um, should make them tiny. In the book, they're a pin, so let's try to make them really small and, you know, really beautiful. Uh, they should last the entire conference. Of course, they should be rechargeable, because what shouldn't be rechargeable, because having alkaline batteries that you throw away at the end is wasteful. Should have cool sensors, because you can't just have a thing that's a, you know, a piece of plastic. So, you know, like a alcohol gas to do like a breathalyzer thing would be cool. Color sensor, humidity. It'd be cool to do body odor, but that's surprisingly hard. Um, <laughs> obviously, there should be a phone app, because everything needs a phone app, so it can be IoT. Uh, it's already a wearable, so it needs to be IoT as well. Um, so, you know, you want to be able to share patterns, it should have a social component, um, it needs to be able to interface with other badges, you should break out all the GPIO, because people are definitely going to hack it. You should do a super cool crypto puzzle, because that's another cultural element of badges at DEF CON, is having puzzles of different sorts, especially cryptographically related puzzles. Um, so. A thing that I've discovered is important, since I've been a practicing engineer, uh, is that it's important to identify the problem you want to solve, and then solve that problem, and then not solve the other problems. Because <laughs> it turns out those other problems aren't going to get you to the th whatever the thing is you want. It's important to really think about what you want to come out of this process. So, my goal for this project was to learn something about business. So, the year before, I kind of like put I started learning about electronics, and I learned some things about electronics, and that was great. So this year, the, the thing to learn would be like, okay, so I want to sell this. That's probably something I want to do in the future, so let's practice by like building this thing. So let's build it and sell it. So the sub-goals to make that possible are actually finish it, because wow, that's so hard. <laughs> Finishing things is so difficult. So that's like, goal number one is finish it. Scale everything, every decision, so that I can actually finish it. Whatever finish it means, even if that just means blank boards, Finish it. Build enough units that I can actually sell them and share them with people because just having one for myself is kind of no fun. Um, and then don't go broke while doing it. So reduce personal financial risk as much as possible, which ends up looking like a bunch of other decisions, which we'll see later. So this is it. These are the decisions. This is my ordered list of things that I'm going to accomplish with the badge. So. <laughs> We're going to do none of this stuff on the previous slide. It's gonna have LEDs. LEDs are important. LEDs are, I don't say not that hard, that's not true, but LEDs are important. Um, I like things that are interactive. Uh, I mentioned earlier that in the end it did like a cool communication thing. I like that, you know, you stand around in close groups of people and they kind of interact. That's cool. So it should communicate in some way. It shouldn't communicate in any of those ways. That was dumb. I shouldn't do that. 
Uh, and it should last the entire conference, because it's, wow, if only there was some way that I could make this name tag, this badge type object stick on my shirt, that'd be great. Um, it should last the entire conference. None of these other things, none of the other things matter. These are the things that I figured I could probably do given, the, given my previous ordered list of goals. So the slightly more refined version is uh, 10 RGB LEDs, because that's an arbitrarily chosen convenient number. Um, 10 by 10 centimeters, because a lot of the Chinese PCB fabs have um, cost buckets at 5 by 5 and 10 by 10 centimeters, and I was going to get it made at the cheapest, dirtiest fab house I could find, and, and that meant keeping it to a convenient bucket size. Um, I like infrared for communication, because depending on how you do it, it's relatively simple. There's lots of existing literature about, um, <laughs> not IRDA, but like RC5 and, um, what are the, f no, Philips is RC, anyway, the existing like, TV remote stuff. So like that's a very documented thing, easy to analyze with logic analyzer, all that. Um, it's also very short range and it's line of sight, which is bad in many situations, but good in the situation where you only want it to interact with the stuff immediately around you. Um, it should pow be powered off a double A AA or a triple A, small, light, easy to source, easy to source, easy to source, easy to ship, easy to ship, easy to ship, unlike a lithium battery, easy to ship, easy to source, um, <laughs> cheap, small. Uh, it should have stuff exposed because whatever, maybe people are gonna hack on them We'll come back to that. Um, and aim for a, like a, nice, a nice sale price so that it makes some profit. Um, DEF CON is also funny because it turns out when you get a bunch, of a bunch of people who call themselves hackers in a room, they don't really want to use credit cards. They do like using cryptocurrency and they like using US cash money. They don't like using other things. So make it like a, pe if people are gonna pay me in cash, make it a cost increment that's convenient to pay in cash. Um, so here's some random part choices I made. Um, used an ST micro because boy, Little Cortex M0s are unbelievably inexpensive, inexpensive to the point where they're cost competitive with A-tinies and stuff, um, and they're very convenient to work with. Uh, because I'm not doing any interesting wireless stuff, I'm only doing infrared and I can pretty much bit bang that. I don't care about having something that integrates a Bluetooth radio or a Wi-Fi radio. I'm not dealing with an antenna or any wireless or anything like that. Um, I don't especially like NeoPixels because I don't really like the weird timing protocol. Uh, I really like dot stars in Adafruit parlance or APA 102Cs in China terms. Um, they're like dot star or like NeoPixels, but they have six pins uh, because they speak spy, so it's power ground, clock in, clock out, data in, data out. Super dumb, super easy to control, super easy to source. Um, in 2007 when I did this, 15 cents a pop, which was great for controller integrated, that was all fine. Uh, NeoPixels are cheaper because they're more prevalent, though that's maybe changed a little. Um, looking at battery sizes, I didn't really know how much power this thing was gonna draw, so double A, whatever, it's not a lot larger. Um, battery charger is cost, complexity, assembly time, little to no gain. If it lasts the whole, everything is, it needs to last the whole conference. It doesn't need to last any longer than that. So like a rechargeable battery would be great, but the like complexity of adding the parts and the increased cost and the assembly time and all that, not going to deal with it. LiPos are really, really, really hard to ship, uh, as Whitney may address later. Um, it was all complicated. Didn't want to deal with that. Uh, and then these were going to be hand assembled. So I don't remember at what point I decided I was going to build 100. At some point I decided I was going to build 100. 100 was about right. Not going to want to do more than 100 hand assembled. But if I was going to hand assemble them, um, I wanted something that I'd be able to inspect and conceivably fix. Not that I can't inspect or fix QFN or BGA, I can't inspect and fix BGA, but QFN. Um, but there was no, I wasn't so size constrained that it made sense to go to something that was gonna be more difficult for me to work on. So uh, QFP type stuff that has actual like feet that you can see and touch with a multimeter, that's just great. Uh, and 0805s, because I don't need to flex by soldering tiny stuff, that's, this is no point. Um, okay, so reduce uh, reduce personal financial risk means build lots of prototypes for as little money and effort as possible. So uh, another reason I love ST parts is that dev kits, um, this, this series of boards is called a disco kit for discovery. Uh, so get a disco kit, throw it in a breadboard, buy some LED strip, stick stuff together, figure out roughly what I think is probably gonna work. Um, so then I built what I would call the non-form factor 1.0 prototype, which is what we would call it at work if we were building a client for it. Um, it turns out that I don't have a printer, but I do have a very small CNC mill. So uh, instead of like printing things out and seeing if your footprints fit, I just cut a board, whatever, it'll be fine. Um, I have this guy and it still works, which is incredible. Um, I happily show it to people. Uh, it's very, very, very ugly. 
and wrong in a number of ways. But it did, <laughs> it did successfully test that all the like programming and power stuff for the micro is fine. LEDs were properly connected. Boost worked the way I thought it would work. Infrared receiver and transmitter worked. I ripped some traces off and things kind of got bridged in a fight. It's fine. It all worked. Uh, it all worked fine. Um, these are, we'll come back to them in a minute, these are unbelievably cool LEDs. They're the APA 102Cs, but they're in a 2020 package, which is to say they're two, millimeter, two millimeters on a side and most assuredly leadless. Um, they're incredibly cool. It's incredible you can build a tiny little RGB LED with controller in something that's two millimeters on an edge. Uh, they're just amazing. We'll come back to those in a minute. All of those did work at one point on this board, uh, hand soldered on a milled PCB. It took a lot of debugging. Um, great, okay, so let's do another round of prototypes. This time, like, I had validated that it would mostly work, so get an actual board made. At this point, the cost of getting the boards made is so low that it really almost makes sense to just immediately do that once you've breadboarded something, but whatever. Um, okay, so this is mostly the same. You can see there's a little bodge because I needed to move the pin for um, the LED, the infrared transmit, which is an interesting story. So. Um, an element of sourcing from China is what you can actually buy. So you'll often find very high availability for certain configurations of certain parts and certain SKUs and certain packaging. And that's because they're used in something else. So the market is like awash with them. So at some point I had chosen a CPU, which was a slightly different STM32F0, and I realized that I couldn't buy any of them from China, and buying them from DigiKey or Mauser was dramatically more expensive. So I searched around and I found a slightly crummier STM32F0, um, which didn't matter because this isn't enormously complicated. So Crumier is fine, um, but it had different timer peripherals. And that was when I realized that if you plan ahead you, and you look at like a series of CPUs, you can see that like timer one, timer one is in this entire series and all the pins are all mapped the same way. So if you need to slide up and down the series because it turns out you can't source the part you thought, timer one will still be there and it'll still be on the same pin, which means you can drop it in because all the power stuff's all the same. So I think this was the point that I did that and I had to move one of the pins to get to a timer peripheral which was actually physically present on this board. Um, this is also the last time I used the APA 102Cs in the 2020. So this is like the relative, so normally you find them in the 5050 package which is the normal RGB LED, NeoPixel, whatever size. This is the relative, this is insane, hand soldering this in more than quantity like, you know, whatever, 10 or something. Nah, that's not gonna, reflow and stencil maybe but Debugging them, they have no leads. Debugging them is really hard. There's no, there's no point unless you really need to. So crypto privacy, Whitney will at some point, I'm sure, show. They actually did use those LEDs. Their boards were professionally assembled and they look beautiful. Uh, these were not gonna be professionally assembled or look beautiful. So um, <laughs> you can see I soldered two on and that was when I hit my tolerance for doing this shit. <laughs> and then I stopped because there was no point. That was when I decided I was gonna not use these anymore. Uh, so I did another round of prototypes. I never ended up building these. This is the same thing, but with a larger, um, larger LED package. I thought they looked cool. Silk is free, so I played around with like my logo and stuff. Um, you'll notice another change. This has three buttons, a user button, a reset button, and a button to put it in a serial bootloader. This has one button. This has the DFU button, which is the button to put it in the serial bootloader, because I figured maybe someone would want to program their board, and, and they would not have a, an ST programmer on them, an ST link or whatever. Um, so I wanted to make it so people could actually program it with an FTDI or something. Um, so that was great. All the other buttons are cost, complexity, and time. And you don't need a user button. User's not going to be able to do anything. Uh, we can kind of put it on the same pin. So I guess we'll keep the user button. You don't need a reset button. Why do you need a reset button? No one's going to be reprogramming. You just pull the battery out if you need to reset it. Remove that. Uh, let's see. And then we combine the DFU and the user button because those are just strapping pins. It's like, okay, now we're down to one button. Uh, okay, so then I did what you might refer to as the form factor one, which is approximately the, the size and shape, which was to test a bunch of things. One was to test the size and shape to see if it was like pleasant to wear. I think I laser cut a few and like wore them around my house on a lanyard. <laughs> my roommate like, what are you wearing? He's like, oh, this is my laser cut DEF CON badge. <laughs> you, you don't wear that mechanical engineering friend? That's not normal for you to wear in the house? Um, it's kind of a bunch of other stuff that was tested here. You can see there's no art. Um, the layout, this was at the time the most complicated thing that I had done. So it was like, how is this going to really work? How hard is this actually going to be? Um, I assure you, I <laughs> surpassed this with something that's much less pleasant to work on this year. Um, but this tested the actual arrangement of, of all the bits and bobs. Um, this tested the 
Lanyard hole size, I used the crypto privacy lanyard holes and they were too small. Yeah, Whitney, they were too small. I had to make them larger. My lanyards are not as nice as your lanyards were. <laughs> um, yeah, this is also, uh, I made these using PCBWay, one of many Chinese board houses, not on the bottom of the dirty scale. Uh, they're very pleasant. Um, okay, and then what you would call the form factor 1.1 because versioning is cool. So this is, this is the thing I actually ended up bringing, it's the thing that I'm wearing. Um, mostly cosmetic changes, uh, hid stuff. Got my mom to do this silk, that worked out really well. She's a lot better at art than I am. I think she did a great job. <laughs> Had to kind of explain what she was, it was not really clear to her when I just sent her a PDF of the top of the board, what exactly was going on and what she should do, but uh, once I showed her, that worked better. Um, I removed the user LED, I think. Yeah, there's some unpopulated pads here, which I accidentally got solder paste. Um, user LED, it's covered in LEDs. Why do you need another, another LED? That doesn't make any sense. Cost, complexity, time. Um, I also made an interesting choice. I, for some reason, was worried about sourcing these very normal uh, 1206 IR LEDs, so I uh, stuck holes for a through-hole part in case I decided that I really just needed a through-hole um, IR LED. Otherwise, though, is it relatively small changes? Um, there were, let's see, a uh, cheesy quote, it was covered, which is good, but silk is free, so like put stuff on the board, whatever. Um, there were, ah, uh, yeah, okay, there were a couple funny little things. So I was testing with really nice premium battery holders from DigiKey made by a manufacturer with a data sheet. Uh, and for the real thing, there are certain parts which are much cheaper from China, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so these are the rattiest, lowest quality injection molded parts I have ever seen. They have flash and sink, and they didn't, the mold didn't quite flow, so the corners don't always meet all the way. Uh, but boy, they really hold the battery in, so that was fine. The problem is that <laughs> there's no, no data sheet or mechanical drawings, so I had to guess the hole size, and you'll notice that they're not in, so it's supposed to be inside for AAA and outside for AA. They didn't fit there. They fit off by one, which was fine for this prototype, but at that point I had all of them in hand, so I readjusted the hole pattern so it would match China. Um, also still back up in case I wanted to switch to a AAA, still holes for those. Um, the other thing is these LEDs have a really interesting failure mode where when you heat them, they either explode or they crack, or when you try to manually rework them, um, they're not, we'll say not Rojas compliant in their reflow temperature profile. So when you heat them, they melt really quickly. Uh, if you're looking through the lens when you heat them, you can see the heat travel along the, len along, along the leg under the lens. And when it hits the bond wire, that's the end of your LED. So I added an interesting feature. So these let you jump the clock and data across an LED. So the failure, they're in a chain. So the failure mode was normally you lose an LED, that LED will go crazy and then everything downstream won't work. Uh, and I was worried about fixing those in the field, and I wasn't going to bring magnification or really be able to reliably fix them. So the theory was you just rip the LED off, which is easy without magnification, uh, and then solder across the bridges, and it'll jump across the LED in the chain. That totally works. That was a good choice. I'm glad I did that. Um, okay, so at that point, I had like a design. Somewhere in there, I went through the like, let's choose a board house and try to like come up with a cost estimate, figure out our multiple, things like that. Um, generated approximate cost quantity curves to figure out kind of, maybe, actually, maybe this is where I chose that I was going to build 100, because I wasn't, yeah, I think that's what it was. I didn't know the hubris of my, oh, I'll build hundreds at home in my kitchen table. No. I didn't know that. I didn't have that hubris before this project. So I think at some point I, like, figured out that there's, like, a nice kind of heel at around 100. Um, yeah. I looked at professional assembly. These quantities are not in my research at the time, at least, these quantities were not friendly to professional assembly. Not that it's not possible and not that it's totally bananas, but um, my unit cost ended up being about seven and a half dollars. The, at quantity 100 with the assembly and everything, it's, it was, I don't remember the number, unfortunately, but it was significantly higher. Um, yeah, I think whenever I made this slide, I estimated that it was twice the bomb cost just for the assembly. Um, okay, so, you know, Take your CAD tool, generate a bomb, figure out costs, generate a costed bomb. So I was like doing some comparison shopping from China, primarily on AliExpress. Uh, and there are certain there are certain things, there's certain things which are much better to get from China than from US suppliers if you can tolerate all the different kinds of uncertainty. Um, infrared receivers, uh, seven cents instead of 0.6 cents for the like legit Vichet, whatever part. Um, CPUs, 
58 cents instead of a dollar. Half, half savings isn't bad. The real gem here uh, is this. this, is this these are the CPUs. Um, this is how I received them. They were in a padded envelope. Uh, there's a few things. One, this bottom edge is jagged of this tray. 99% sure what happened was someone had a run. They were using this part. They finished the run. They're like, okay, sell these, snap it off, <laughs> saran wrap it, throw it in an envelope, and put it in the mail. And then I got them in America. It was great. Uh, cling film, you'll notice that works on like electrostatic. That's probably fine. <laughs> the CPU is probably not an issue. I had one, one dead CPU out of 110, so I assume all the ESD went into that one CPU and that was it. Um, yeah, AliExpress is great. There's other, there's other sites. AliExpress is, is, is my fave. Um, things that are hard to screw up without a data sheet is good. Switches and things that have mechanical footprints and like funny pad patterns and stuff. That's, I don't know, unless you will get, <laughs> when you buy from China, you will get exactly what you see in the photos and exactly nothing else. Maybe you can email them and maybe you'll get a data sheet and maybe it'll be for the part that you think it's for. But like, if you can see in the photos, there's like a, a posting and an LED and a pinout. That pinout's probably for that LED. You're probably good. Anything else? So like the battery holders, they were inexpensive enough that I ended up just buying 120 or whatever of them and I just got them ahead of enough, uh, far enough ahead that I could just look at them and you could see on the earlier prototypes. I just looked at them and measured them and then like milled a little board and tested that they fit and then great, that worked. So it was nice that there was... I had chosen that part far enough ahead that I could buy it and have it in hand and know for sure, really for sure, it was really going to work. Um, alternate parts. This year I'm sourcing um, bare non-controller RGB LEDs. Uh, to my surprise, there's really no standardization, um, even given like common anode, no standardization for what's pin one, what pin is marked as what you would think would be pin one, and which pin is the anode. So. I built some test boards a couple months ago and one of them worked and one of them didn't. The one that didn't was the China board because I didn't pay enough attention to the footprint when I bought the LED and it was just different. So um, this time I surveyed, I did a thorough survey of AliExpress and I, I looked at like 50 different seller postings for 35, 28 RGB LEDs and I, I like aggregated them and I'm like, okay, anode in the, com in the lower left or so you can rotate it that way is common. We'll go with anode in the lower left so that there's probably another supplier if this one turns out it doesn't work. Um, yeah, I think most of the rest of this is things that I've said. Um, okay, so then I assembled them. Um, this is the path to failure. This looks good. This is the path to failure. This is the one man with a beer and Netflix approach. <laughs> you will not build a hundred of anything and be totally fully sane at the end if you use this approach. You have to learn from the people who know it best. Go. Full scale, you got people that you're not gonna pay, you put them in a room, you make it clear they can't leave until they're done. Uh, there were windows open, I should have closed the windows for the full effect. Um, you're, gonna, you're, gonna want a you're gonna want a bunch of people and you're gonna want them to sit in a line and you're gonna want them to do what, they, what you tell them to do, reliably and repeatedly. So this was the assembly, the assembly workflow. Um, boards with uh, leaded hassle, leaded solder paste, uh, kitchen table, fiberglass. That was fine. That was not a problem. My roommate didn't, he didn't mind. Um, so there was a workflow. So I sat here. Um, I made them in these, if you, you can grab one of the panels from the bag if you want. Um, I made them in these three by one panels. That was a mistake, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so they came in these panels. Uh, I, well here, you can pass around and look at it. I don't know. People haven't, panels are cool. You can get circuit boards stuck together. In the real world, you would use panels. Um, so I used a stencil, which we'll come to in a minute also, squeegee the paste on, um, put the boards on the shelf, uh, friend takes boards off, stuffs, I don't know, I don't remember what Michelle stuffed, some things, passes it to next friend, okay, stuffs passives, passes it to next person, stuffs LED, passes it back to me, stuff the boost and the inductor, the inductor is the most fun because you can't put it on backwards, uh, and it only goes in one place, uh, stuff the inductor, um, Unfortunately, due to a mistake, I had to snap all the boards out of the panel, which is unfortunate because at that point the components are held on just by whatever the surface tension of the and tackiness of the paste is. So snapping them means the components will just disappear into the carpet. <laughs> so you have to very carefully snap the boards out of the panel and then put them on a shelf uh, and reflow them. So that was the workflow. Uh, that worked great. We built about 60 over the course of a day, you could say. 
um, probably six hours and then maybe a couple more hours of reflow oven. Um, that was fine. That was, I think that, that worked okay. 100 is a decent target when doing that. Obviously, you could do this for more days and you'd have more boards. Um, I don't know. This was something that I hadn't actually done until this project. Solder paste stencils are amazing, and depending on where you're getting your boards from, very inexpensive. Um, in the real <laughs> caveat, I'm not a professional engineer, so it's possible I'm going to be wrong in the next three seconds, in which case, just erase that and pretend I was right. So in the real world, you would get a panel, and you put the panel in a machine, and you'd get a stencil. A stencil is a laser-cut piece of usually stainless steel, usually laser-cut, which has apertures for your solder paste. You <laughs> the paste down, which is, it always makes that noise. Uh, then you take, you take a credit card, like a line of Coke, and you go boop, boop, <laughs> and you squeegee the paste through the holes, and then it's on your board on all the pads that you asked for, you asked for there to be paste. In the real world, the stencil would be much larger, probably because it would be mounted to a frame, and you'd mount the frame and the panel and some other things into a machine, and the machine would do the squeegeeing, and the machine would take the board out, and the machine would move the board to the next stage and go through the reflow oven and, or the placing and whatever. Um, so you can do that at home. Super easy, super fast. Uh, to get the right height, just tape some other panels down that you're not going to need. Masking tape, <laughs> the stencil to the boards, tape the table, tape the boards to the table, flip the stencil down, make sure you've constrained the thing you're going you're gonna to stencil, paste, squeegee, flip it back, pull it out, put the next one in. Super fast, super reliable, uh, much more reliable at least than me doing it by hand or me like hand squeezing the, the paste out. Um, you should clean your stencil. If you do this, you clean your stencil immediately after using it, immediately after using it, before doing anything else. Do not leave your stencil for weeks sitting on the table. The <laughs> flux turns to glue, and then you get this sandy, nasty glue, and then you find yourself in the bathroom of your rented home, rubbing paste into the wonderful countertop as you try to get it off of your stencil. Um, so clean your stencil when you're done using it. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually have a little reflow oven, um, which is cool. It works very well for some definitions of very well. Uh, it came from uh, my friend's company imploding. After it imploded, they didn't need their reflow oven anymore. Um, so I got it. I've bought him a number of dinners, and he's here in the room so he can see me saying this to his face. Um, reflow oven works pretty well. The seven minute reflow cycle takes about 11 and a half minutes. <laughs> it's because it doesn't work that well. Um, <laughs> incidentally, it doesn't heat very evenly, so you can only bake things directly in the center, really, if you put more than, the way it worked out for the dragonflies, more than two nestled in the center the edges don't reflow properly. Um, if I had been, <laughs> if the oven had worked correctly and I had planned well, I would have designed the panel to fit in the oven so I could have stuffed the panel, put the whole panel in the oven and closed the oven with the whole panel inside and then baked it. That would have been great. I should have planned for that. Darn. <laughs> and that was why I snapped them out. Um, that made it take a lot longer. Also, it, it took hours to run all the rest of these things to the oven because the oven is very slow and very small. Um, Pogo fixtures, if you're programming a bunch of boards, I Hackaday Benchoff has published articles about this. Um, I'm far from the only person who will say this. Pogos are really cool, the little spring-loaded pins with little pointy teeth at the end. Um, they're really convenient for building things like programming fixtures because you don't, one, I was not going to pay for headers for every badge. That's a waste of my money. Uh, it's also more time to assemble, and most people aren't going to need it anyway, so it doesn't matter. It would just be a waste. So the answer was through holes and then pogos. Um, in this case, I used an old board. I shoved the pogos through and soldered them in, and then you just take the old board and you squeeze it on top of the board you're programming, and you hit the Enter key. That's it. Great. Worked great. Strongly recommended if you're building more than a few of something. Um, test firmware. Have test firmware. In this case, had the assembled boards. Just stuck a battery across the connector to make sure that um, the boost worked and everything powered up. Flashes LEDs. In this case, they can kind of self-test themselves, which is very nice. If you're building more than one or two of something, definitely do that. Um, okay, so as far as this project goes, um, I built, I ended up, I aimed for 100, I got a 5% overage, so I could have built 105. 85 worked totally, which is not a great yield, but that's how it ended up. Fortunately, my cost curve said that selling all of those would more than pay for the cost of the project, so that was okay, that was acceptable, I had planned for that. Um, I sold most of them, so they cost me about 750. The, if you take the cost of all the rounds of prototyping and you munge it across all the units, it comes out to about 950. Um, so 30 bucks, which is on the far low end of the DEF CON badge scale, um, was a, a little more than a 3x multiple. So that was great. Um, 20 didn't work. One was the bad ESD CPU. A few were things that I incorrectly assembled. And then most of them were LED failures. Almost all of them were LED failures. And almost all the LED failures were from batches that I 
did myself, not with the full workflow, which meant that it took a lot longer from paste down to going to the oven and they didn't really flow properly. Hindsight is great, which is another reason to use a, a bunch of people so you can turn them over faster. You get a few hours before the paste starts getting weird. Um, in this case, I transported them to DEF CON myself. I, my girlfriend was kind enough to let me put all of my clothes in her suitcase so I could fill my suitcase with parts. Um, <laughs> we had just moved in, so I had all this great IKEA corrugated stuff because I spent every single brownie point that I had to that, up to that point to move in and then not unpack anything and just do this instead of unpacking. Um, so I like stuck all the badges, no battery holders, through these like bamboo skewers and taped the thing shut and wrapped it up and stuck it in my suitcase surrounded by tools and AA batteries. You're only allowed to take batteries for personal use on an airplane, even if you're going to trade shows, even if they're not lipos. So if someone asked me why I had 100 alkaline batteries, the answer was I have a battery powered soldering iron and I don't know how many batteries I'll need. <laughs> it's true, I did and I didn't know. Uh, the strategy was take everything out of the everything out and put it in bins, go through TSA. TSA was okay with that. On the way out, everything got inspected, which is what I expected. It's very difficult to explain to a TSA agent what the hell these are and, <laughs> and what they do, but that worked out okay. Um, got to the hotel room, whatever, morning of DEF CON. Uh, hotel conveniently provides plenty of space for soldering, rework, and programming. Uh, so brought out all the badges, got a hundred something used DigiKey bags from a friend who has a hundred something used DigiKey bags, organized very nicely by size in a binder. He's that kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> so unwrapped them from the, the funny packaging, programmed them all. Um, if they bo booted, I counted that as tested, and then bagged them. So everyone got a Dragonfly, a lanyard, the cheapest lanyard I could find. Dragonfly, a lanyard, um, and a battery in a bag, which is the full, the full kit. Then I <laughs> took them, and I put all of them in my backpack, and then I walked to Caesar's Palace, and I sold them in a hallway. <laughs> <laughs> DEF CON is great. <laughs> So uh, the sales channel, we'll say, was a hashtag, the Badge Life hashtag, which lots of people were also looking at. Um, other folks, like the crypto privacy fo folks and many other badge groups, had been flogging that hashtag a lot, so people were looking at it. So I, <laughs> I walked up an escalator, and on the escalator, this guy was like, hey, that's cool. What is it? I'm like, oh, it's a badge I made. And he's like, cool, can I buy one? And I'm like, yeah. And then he traded me U.S. cash money for a badge that I made out of my backpack on an escalator. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so this is, this is a photo of me with, the, I don't know who he is, but he's the, per the first person to ever buy anything that I had ever made, which was a thoroughly magical experience that I strongly recommend to anyone. So they sold really easily. I registered, and then I stood across the hallway from registration, and I tweeted that I was there, and then people just walked up to me until all of them were gone. And then I traded the rest, and that was it. So that was, I had properly predicted demand and feature set and things like that. Um, so the hardware and everything worked, worked really well. Battery life was good. Um, nice for people who don't like the DEF CON aesthetic is a funny, I don't know how to phrase this in the right way. The DEF CON aesthetic uh, is wide spanning. So the uh, Bender badge, I have one, and there's, um, he's wearing one, is a giant smoking robot skull, which is really cool. But also, maybe you don't want to buy a giant smoking robot skull for your kid. <laughs> Everyone has different preferences. Um, the dragonflies ended up being sort of in a different place on the like style and size spectrum, which I think helped me, which was nice. Um, it's also small and light and doesn't have too many sharp corners. Um, functionality was good. The $30 price was set because it was a nice multiple and because I was hoping the response I would get would be, hey, you want to buy one? And someone goes, 30 bucks? Yeah, okay. I guess that's fine. And then just buy it. And that was exactly the response I got. So I think that was probably a little lower than maybe I could have priced it. But the first <laughs> goal three, I guess, actually, was don't go broke making these things. So it was more important to me to sell them for a lower but still very nice multiple than it was to try to squeeze every penny of cash out. Plus, I would have felt like an ass. Um, it's convenient that it, it, it only does one thing, which is convenient when you're explaining to someone what it does, though that actually kind of brings up an interesting point. People, people see it and they go, oh, it's blinky and cool. People don't walk up and go, boy, your infrared communication technology is very effective. I'm interested. <laughs> That's not how people buy things. <laughs> That's definitely what I thought would happen. That's not how people buy things. So as far as cutting, 
cutting my feature set down to exactly one thing. That was a good choice, because it turned out that one thing was pretty visible, and spending time to make my infrared code incredibly bulletproof would have been a total waste, because that's, it's not a total waste, because it would make me feel good, and it would be a fun exercise. But as far as selling a widget goes, that's orthogonal to the goal of selling the widget, because no one's gonna, unless that's the whole point of the widget, no one's gonna know that. Um, I don't know, the LEDs suck. Uh, strap holes are kind of funny, they don't hang right. Um, mostly it worked fine. Uh, there are lots of other ways to fund something like this. I'm doing it again this year. I'm self-funding it again. You can do a Kickstarter. Lots of people do Kickstarters, people do pre-sales. Um, once you take someone's money, at least my worry was, once I took someone's money, I had at that point promised them a feature set and promised them that I was gonna deliver a thing. And I had scaled the cost in such a way that I didn't actually need to do that to pay for them, and that would have made it a job. At that point, it's like, I have to finish it, and it has to work. Otherwise, I will feel bad, and I will have like f taken people's money, and then f I will be another failure statistic. So without doing that, up until the point that I like stood across from registration with my widgets, I could have put them all in a paper shredder, and that would have been fine. Like I didn't owe anyone anything, so I could scale the difficulty. And If it turned out selling things had really sucked, that's fine. I could have just stopped selling them. That would have been okay. I didn't promise anyone anything. So I'm gonna self-fund it again for that reason. You can also get sponsorship. I don't know. I don't like talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> and sponsorship is similar, like, I'm gonna give you five of these things and they're gonna be really great and then, well, you can only give them four and they're not quite as great as you thought. I don't know. Um, future plans, so the, the big change this year will be that I'm gonna try to make a lot. I'm gonna try to make on the order of around, <laughs> I'm gonna say this publicly, I'm gonna try to make around 500. We'll see how that turns out. But that means that I'm not gonna make them at my kitchen table. I'm gonna get them professionally assembled and once I'm getting them professionally assembled, well, I can use smaller parts. And if I'm using smaller parts, I can change the size and it turns out the incremental cost of switching to a four layer board isn't that high and you can use QFN parts, and you can stick a bunch more parts on, and the incremental cost of two-sided assembly, which I didn't want to do at home. Two-sided assembly isn't actually that much more expensive, so like, now I've flipped all the switches. So this year's gonna be a lot more complicated <laughs> than last year was. Um, so this year's goal is, last year was learn how to like, sell some things and reliably go from like two-ish or three-ish to 100-ish. This year will be learn how to package instructions so I can send them to someone I've never met in another continent and have them successfully run them to test my board. Uh, and how do you choose things that you could actually get made by real people who are gonna want like properly reeled parts and things like that. Um, how do you deal with, like really deal with vendors when you're buying 25,000 LEDs? And how do you deal with assembly houses and things like that? So those are, I'm scaling it up, those are my goals. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I'm a random guy that maybe you met on the internet. Please put your email in my mailing list. It'll be fine. I don't have anyone to sell them to, so I won't sell them. Um, if you want sources, hardware or, or software, it's all open source, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, GitHub link. Um, I have all the prototypes and stuff, so at some point if you want to find me and look at them, I have a bunch of other random badges and things too. Uh, come find me and I'll like show you the cool things that I have in my bag. Um, so that's it. I'm Kerry or Borgel on the internet. Uh, thanks.